Hi, Myra. Thank you for joining us at SEG Sales Summit. We're so excited to interview you today. Just, just thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brian. So happy to be here. Yeah. So um, I've known you for the last six to nine months, and you know you're an inspiration to me, and I know many other people. And you know, would love just to hear a little bit more about that. And the first thing that we've talked about at the summit with every speaker is just vulnerability. As you can see on the left-hand corner of the sc screen, we talk a lot about um, the people that are able to coach, train, mentor people, and in your case, grow a company. You know, a lot of times we look at the best practices and we focus on that, but there's always a story about that and how they got there to be able to do that. And I'd love just to talk more about like, what things you've done in the past and the vulnerability around that. Yeah, so uh, it's really interesting. I think, you know, your success as a leader depends so much upon your vulnerability and how, you know, you portray yourself to, to not only your customers, but to your staff, right? So, um, you know, when we look at vulnerability and, and leadership, why would someone feel comfortable being vulnerable because they're confident, right? So um, if you have the confidence to be vulnerable, um, that leads you to have connecting experiences with, with your staff and people around you, um, which leads to humility, which leads to trust. So when you expose yourself in that way, when you're, you allow yourself to be vulnerable, it makes you human and it makes people trust you. Um, you know, it's, it's a delicate situation in, in business, right? Um, you have a relationship uh, and it's more than a business relationship if you're doing it right. It's a relationship in which you trust someone. Hopefully um, you are able to have a friendship in that relationship and all of it comes down to trust and I believe being vulnerable, vulnerable is is absolutely what leads to that. I think a lot of people, though, feel that vulnerability in business is like a double-edged sword, right? So, um, you know, exposing yourself emotionally is viewed by a lot of people, especially um, some older thinkers in the industry, as as exposing yourself in a negative way. Um, and I don't think that way at all. I think the leader of the future. Um, absolutely is vulnerable, um, you know, expresses that they're human, that they have a family, that they have interests outside of work. And I think all of these things connect you to people. When you feel connected with someone, you trust them and you want to do business with them. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. Um, any certain stories like from, you know, getting to where you're at today and past experience of being vulnerable, like any stories that you look at and say, look, that had to happen for me to be here today. And, you know, I know during the sales summit, we've had people say, look, at the time when I was in this moment, it was not easy. I was actually thinking, am I ever gonna get out of this? This is, but then I look back on it and I'm like, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. But at the time, right, yeah. it did, it was like, whoa, what's, what's going on? Anything like that, that you, you can share with us? I do have a story like that. So um, I work for my family's company and I didn't join the company until I felt in a place where I could be a leader. Um, so I had a variety of different jobs, sales jobs, um, working with people, working for other powerful women. Um, so I joined kind of later in life. And uh, one of the first experiences I had speaking um, was completely unprepared. I was chosen, literally drawn from a hat to speak um, at a huge conference in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I had landed at, I think, one o'clock in the morning from visiting a manufacturer in England the night before. I literally got the flu on the plane and I had to fly to Atlanta the next morning at five o'clock in the morning. I think I slept for two hours. I took my fever, my temperature before I left for the airport and I had a 103 degree fever, <laughs> but oh I had to go God. to this conference. So I get to this massive conference. It's NMSDC. It's the biggest minority conference that there is in Atlanta. I mean, there are executives from Facebook and Coca-Cola and the largest health systems in the country and Ford and General Motors and all these, you know, huge companies. Um, I'm asked if I would um, enter into a contest to pitch my company and to speak. There's thousands of people there, right? 
I'm sweating bullets already. I'm ghastly pale. And I guess what? I get chosen to speak. So, oh, um, my God. Yeah. So uh, I have about five minutes to prepare my thoughts. I can't even think. I'm mm -hmm. dehydrated. It's bad. I'm dizzy. So I have to go on the stage in front of thousands of people and pitch my company. And when I tell you I felt so vulnerable in that moment, that I, that doesn't even begin to cover it. So in that audience were some of my biggest customers in healthcare and several of them that I was trying to forge relationships with. And I looked at them in the audience and I'm like, this is the impression. I have, this is what it, this is what I have to do. So there's all of us are speaking on stage. I bring it together and I ended up tying for second place in the contest. I won a meeting, all these different things. But you know, after that, I asked to get dinner with someone who was in the audience and I told him how I felt. And I said, you know what? I've been, don't sit too close to me. I've been battling this illness. And I, and I allowed him to see how nervous and terrified and I didn't feel well and I was sweating and all these things. Um, and that was like maybe four years ago to this day, that is now my biggest customer. And I think because I allowed him to see that side of me and I told him what it really felt like and I didn't yeah. put on this facade, like it's okay, it's all right, it's gonna be okay uh, and hide how I really felt, it was exhausting. And I told him that and I think I let him in and saw a side of me like, this is difficult. It's very difficult being an entrepreneur. It's difficult flying, you know, jet lagged, speaking, trying to make it and honestly trying to grow your business. Um, I think that that was the key um, in forging our relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, what an amazing story. And I could not agree more. Probably he had something very similar that happened to him, right? And just to share that rather than try to suck it up and just go to dinner and hide it, right? Instead, you know, just honesty and transparency was probably the key in that situation. So what a great story. Um, a, another thing that would love just to learn more about, I remember the first time, you know, I walked into your office in Indiana and sat around a round table and we were talking about recruiting and values and just like the mission of Mac Medical and the importance of, and I'll never forget you and Millie talking about, look, for the last 25 years, we've been breaking that glass ceiling for women in the workforce and we stick to our values. And even to the point, the people we wanna recruit, just keep in mind, right, that everyone is equal. We see everyone for the last 25 years, you know, and not, I, I don't know if every company, A, could admit that over the last 25 years, but it's like from day one, this is what we live by and please keep that in mind. And, you know, 25 years ago, Millie was walking into offices and I think she even made a joke. I was the only woman. Didn't matter if I went to a conference, if I did this and, you know, uh, Mara and myself has stuck to this. We've stuck to our core. This is what we do. This is how we hire. And we've been doing this a lot longer than most organizations. And it's the norm for us. It's not something we've ever had to change. We've stuck by our values for many, many years. So I'd love just to learn more about that history and then passing that on to you, right? And continuing to drive Mac Medical like that. Yeah, it's it's great. I think, you know, my mother's been in this industry for a really long time and it has been very male dominated. I think what, you know, her success is though, is that she's never seen gender and she's never yeah. understood that that was a barrier. Um, you know, but it's not the same for everybody. And women are absolutely disadvantaged in business as are people of color, um, you know, members of the LGBT community, veterans. Um, and she's spent her life, her volunteer life, um, working with other woman-owned businesses and being being a mentor to, to those who um, are trying to make it just like she did. So um, that's very important to us. Of course, we strive to have the most diverse and inclusive um, you know, workforce here at, at Mac Medical. Um, we're extremely diverse um, you know, among all of those categories I just mentioned. Um, and then you know, also in our business relationships. So uh, volunteering for the Women's Business Development Center in Chicago is something my mother's done for many years. Um, 
you know, me carrying on the tradition of that as well. Uh, we um, work with a number of different organizations. I'm a co-chair of the Haida Supplier Diversity Council um, and advocating for, for women in business is, is very important to me. Women, not only in business, but in STEM roles um, where women are certainly a minority. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's extremely important and, you know, true, diversity and inclusion is tricky because while we you know want to be equal we want to also bring attention to the fact that there are barriers um, and there are people who do not um, treat women and minorities the same way I think as we grow yep. and evolve as as a country um, you know it's slowly changing it's changing a little too slowly but it's changing in a good yep. way you know so I think it's this important balance between I want to talk about myself and my business from a genderless point of view. I want to present to you my skills, my company's skills, my staff skills. Um, and I don't want to, you know, talk about gender, but I do, you know, it's um, important for other women in business, other people of color in this industry to be inspired and see that there are leaders um, that look like them, that, talk mm -hmm. like them um but it there's a balance there and it needs to be achieved if you had a look at it and i i love the backdrop about um you know if you look at an industry or a project you're going to tackle and you look different it's probably because it's different and you got to tackle it and face it head on how would you recommend people doing that or you know i'm sure there's stories over the years of how do you go about that yeah, uh, in our industry, we're we're lucky, right? So we are a certified woman-owned business. Um, we're pretty mm -hmm. active in that community, and a lot of our customers, a lot of our hospital customers, a lot of our distributor partners, our GPO, our group purchasing organization partners, are um, very supportive of minority businesses, and they, for the most part, have. Uh, diversity and inclusion executives. Um, and, you know, this is something that's newer in this, this world of business, but very necessary, right? So, you know, my recommendation um, is to find your ally, right? We talk about mm -hmm. um, proactive allyship in business. So um, one of the things that I do in my strategy is I have no relationship with a company, but I'd like to, I search and see if they have an ally for me. And that's often mm -hmm. somebody who is a diversity and inclusion executive. Um, and, you know, that person's employed by the organization to ensure that that company is doing best practices for who they do business with, who they hire, um, you know, making sure that none of these very important steps are being overlooked due to the corporate nature of the company in and of itself. So, um, you know, something that I do is try to forge a relationship, right? When we yeah. talk about, again, coming back to vulnerability, um, you know, yeah. forging an honest relationship, making a connection with a human being, you know, um, you have an opportunity to show the person who you are and ultimately gain your trust. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. We have a new client in Wisconsin. And I thought it was very, you talk about vulnerability. Um, I'll never get, I'll never forget the first conversation with the CEO is he called me and says, Hey, Brian, I, I have a problem and I can't, I got to do something about it. And I'm like, what's that? And he's like, go to my website. And, you know, I typed it in and he said, look at the leadership page and start going down and look at the 30 people that are on the website. And he's like, what do you notice? And he said, I need to recruit differently. And, you know, I've ignored this for many years and um, I, I want to change this and I'm wrong and I, I should have done it differently. And I remember the vulnerability, like his voice was shaking. And you could tell like he was so sincere and we set up a kickoff call and he said, here's how we're going to go about it. And, you know, diversity is important to us and we've done a bad job. And until I change it, I can't change it for everyone else in the organization. And this is the 2021 when we look at our top 
you know, two priorities. This is, this is number one. This is it. So I just thought exactly. that, that vulnerability, right. was like, I'm going to own this. And I thought it was just, it was great. So it is, and it's brilliant. And to have the confidence to do that, this person, this is like true leadership because you know, he recognizes, you know, somebody who is a person of color or a woman who is a perfect fit, who could be a tremendous asset to the company may look at their website and say, I don't know if I should apply for this. Do I belong? There's nobody that looks like no. me. Am I going to have anything in common with these people? So Mara, you know, based on your leadership in your organization, um, do you have any certain like best practices that helps your company evolve or best practices from a management style um, working with your team that you can share? Yeah, I think, you know, we do things really differently at, at Mac Medical, and that's something that we talk about all the time, right? When we hire somebody, we have a whole speech about this. When we um, introduce ourselves, we talk about this. It's, it's woven into the quilt of our existence. Um, and that is, you know, as we grow, it's more difficult, but that is remaining as much um, of a family-owned um, woman-owned company as possible and having our culture that we've had since day one be as strong as it is, you know, today, another 20 years from now, um, you know, through growth, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, you grow and you see it happen to a lot of companies, right? All of a sudden there's private equity involved. It's a corporate structure um, and you mm -hmm. lose that culture. Um, and to me, that's why we're successful. That's why people want to work with us. Um, you know, being flexible, being human, uh, having a personality um, is something really important to us. I don't know if this works for everybody, but it works for us. So um, yeah. I think something I've recognized in leaders um, and in companies um, is personality. I think when you're an entrepreneur and when you're a leader, you have to have a strong presence. Your presence and your personality is your brand. And if that doesn't translate the right way, you're not memorable. People don't trust you. They feel like they don't know you. Um, so I think my advice would be to anyone, a leader, someone just starting in business, um, would be really know your identity and, you know, make sure it translates to your audience. Yeah, and how does that work? Does that happen right up front with onboarding, like going through that and the values and the culture and what Mac, Mac Medical lives by? Does it happen right away through onboarding and acclimating them to the company? Like, how, how do you do that? Because I think some companies say it and they want to do it, but they don't know how to do it. Yeah. Uh right away yes and you know in the hiring process we try to make that clear so they understand it's a fit for them or not right so um you know i think in in hiring um we don't like to have such a formal stuffy uh structure when we're doing interviews we want um you know when we're hiring someone it's a part of our family so uh we want to make sure it's a right fit mutually and that's, that's something that's really important to us, right? They're not just another person that's going to generate revenue for us, not at all. Right. Um, so, you know, in hiring, yes. Um, you know, I think we'll have multiple people talk to them. Um, and it's, it's more than um, a resume. It's more than an education. It's, uh, it's a feel and it's a mutual respect. So um, in all of those formal processes, yes, but throughout employment, you know, we do a lot of fun um, family focused things. We do all types of activities and volunteerism and, you know, lunches and birthdays and our approach to sales and healthcare um, is very much having a good time. You, if you do what you love, and you're good at it, you can have a good time too. So, um, you know, especially in our in our sales team, we really um, encourage their personality to come through. We really encourage people who work for us to forge these relationships with our, our customers um, and have a good time. 
You know, I think yeah. when you're memorable in that way and you can make any kind of human connection, your business life is far more successful. Yeah, it, it's it's so interesting because I've watched you hire two people. And what I really noticed about it is, yes, you know, they have to do the activity, but I'll never forget, like, when I met them and then you guys picked them as, hey, we, we love these two people. They loved the industry and the passion behind, you know, what you and Millie and your team, Jennifer, right? Like, we love the people there. We love the industry. We love the family atmosphere. And I'm always a big fan of they love that. And, you know, you'll like each other a lot and you can see yourself working together from the passion and the drive and, you know, the, the, the values, the activity will happen because they wake up and it's not, I have to make 60 calls today. It's no, I want to, cause I love the industry and I can't wait to talk to people today. And, mm -hmm. you know, I always try to, when I'm talking to new clients and like, Hey, I just want to hire two people that will explain to me how they're going to make 80 calls every day or send 30 emails every day. And I'm like, be careful, right? I would prefer you pick the people that love what you do. And of course they're interviewing because they know that's a part of the job, but I wouldn't get so caught up always in, give me three examples on how you've made 80 calls a day. I would ask more questions about what do you love about my industry? What do you love about the research on our company? You know. What questions do you have for me about our culture and what we do? And I would look to see what their passion feels like and it feels like and what they tell you. And then I would back into the activity because they don't love what you do. And you don't like each other. That's not going to happen anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, 80 calls a day or death makes me cringe so much because <laughs> as soon as you lose the passion, you don't have anything. And no. it comes down to, yes, we all have fun and we love our jobs, but it's a performance no. issue. If no. you don't love what you do, you don't respect your leadership, you don't respect your coworkers, and we need you to step up, we need you to work an extra hour because there's a really hot lead. How likely are you to do that if you hate what you do and you don't respect your boss? Yeah. You're not. So, yep. you know, having this tenant of you get what you give is like, woven right into our motto. And that's how we feel about our customers. That's how we feel about our relationships and our employees. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many people that will jump to the next job for an extra 25K in base. And I actually did that once, right? So I'm guilty of it, talk about vulnerability. And I remember, you know, I had a great 11 year run at one company, I was happy, was smiling, but then I got the, the re the recruitment call where you take 25 more and move. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that'll make me happy. And I remember 90 days in, I literally would walk home almost in tears. And I'm like, what did I just do? It wasn't worth it, right? Like the money wasn't worth it. It was more about loving what you do when you wake up in the morning. So, and yeah, you got to cover your expenses and your, your everything like that. But if you don't love what you do, you know, it's, it's just not fun. Everybody.